Hey guys, welcome to the Learn Feng Shui podcast, where you'll learn feng shui from a classical point of view, taking out the myth and superstition. So if you're interested in learning feng shui, Chinese astrology, all things Chinese metaphysics, as well as the superstitions and myths that connect it all, you'll enjoy learning feng shui with me. Hey guys, let's focus on health for today's episode. Hey guys, starting off, I wanted to talk to you about your body clock. Within Chinese medicine, your body clock and your organs are represented by different times. So coming to us from the Endeavor College of Natural Health, which I'll link to below is a really great article called How to Make Everyday Work for You Using the Ancient Chinese Body Clock. So one of the most important factors within like feng shui and Chinese metaphysics is timing. When we're able to time things the right you know, the right time, we're able to time it correctly, we're able to make our feng shui more impactful. Well, the same holds true to Chinese medicine. Um, it says here, you know, if you know, I'll just re read a quote from here. It says, what if you were able to unlock the secret to making everyday work for you? What if you knew the best time to eat, sleep, exercise, and relax, when to do the most demanding work, and the ideal time to book your therapy sessions or work on personal development? So the Chinese body clock can tell us this. It also states here that over thousands of years, traditional Chinese medicine not only discovered how our organs work, but also how each of them directly impacts emotions and spirit. So if an organ is not imbalancing or functioning as it should be, it can affect both your physical well-being and your emotional well-being. The Chinese organ clock can also be used to guide your understanding of an energy cycle and to help you understand how to best nurture yourself and to do certain things and then of course, when to avoid them, depending on which organ is um, being impacted at that time. So looking at the hours when most people are waking up and getting ready for work from five to 7 a.m., it is the large intestines time. So it's a great time to wake up and start your morning routine. It does say here that choosing exercise, yoga, or some gentle stretching is a good time to move your bowels around. And it states that exercising in the morning is more beneficial than trying to um, exercise in the evening time, like after work, because that's actually the kidneys time to have its detox. Um, I will state though that, um, I mean, if you're exercising and that's the only time you need to exercise, you know, go for it, right? I'm not going to disparage anyone's exercise time, <laughs> but it, it does state that it's the most beneficial in the morning. So it also says that some tips here are drinking a glass of warm water with lemon, um, and then of course stretching and moving and holding off and having your morning coffee until breakfast time. Um, it does say it supports the balance of your hormones and adrenal glands. Um, I, I just can't get with it. The first thing I do in the morning is drink my coffee. I do stretch, um, and it does help to get things moving, so to speak. So it, but it is a good time to excrete and, um, to uh, empty your bowels also. Then we have the areas from seven to nine in which govern the stomach. It does say here that it's really important to eat breakfast during that time because it helps to um, balance the stomach organ um, and meridian points within your body. So stomach energy is extremely important for digestive system, um, building immunity and creating and supporting the body to lead a healthy life. And we all know that you know, those gut biomes are so, so important. So maybe even taking like a probiotic during that time. So here uh, their tips are to eat during the um, window, uh, if you're going to do intermittent fasting, um, to do it early, it does kind of address the fact that intermittent fasting does kind of mess up this routine sometimes. So start off earlier with your, um, your intermittent intermittent eating. It's hard to say it together. Um, it does say hold off on your morning coffee until after breakfast and it interferes with the appetite. It also states that warm food uh, can support the digestive function. Cold food is a shock, shock to the digestive system. And if you consume cold foods regularly, you may feel tired or depleted. So you need that fire chi for your stomach. It also suggests that um, you 
eat some sort of um, vegetables with your your breakfast um and it does suggest you know like a, a spinach omelet or a zucchini omelet you know so it, that does make a really lovely filling for your food um i discovered recently that one of my supermarkets has a lovely strawberry salad with feta in a nice um, strawberry vinaigrette dressing and then they also have like a blueberry version of it and i think that's really lovely to eat in the mornings for myself although admittedly i'm eating cold foods <laughs> so uh, maybe not the best thing right it does say also it's a good time to practice mindfulness so um to quiet down and um enjoy uh just a minute of silence until you start your day from 9 to 11 a.m that is a time that governs the spleen so i had to look this up because i was honestly i was like what is this what's the spleen so the spleen's a fist sized organ in your upper left side of your abdo abdomen 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 <laughs> It's next to your stomach and behind your ribs. It does say here um, that it's an important part of your immune system, although you can survive without it. And to do that, it says to use the energy of this time to schedule your meetings. So I've never heard that, but apparently um, the spleen supports um, like your, your brain function and thinking. The hours of 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. coincidentally are the hours of the horse, the element of fire, and they represent the heart. So both Eastern and Western medicine agree that the heart is revered to be extremely special and the most important organ of your body. Traditional Chinese medicine believes that the heart is responsible for holding on to our memories, which is why news of heart transplant recipients and suddenly acquiring the memory or skills um, of that donor is understood and often expected and accepted. So tips for the heart time. This time is powerful and extremely supportive of creativity and activities that bring you happiness. Remember fire represents spirituality, passion, and happiness. So use this time for brainstorming, trying out artistic endeavors or activities that embody love and joy. And I would also think to meditate on some sort of gratitude would be a really good activity for that time. So 1 to 3 p.m., it governs the small intestines. This is the period of time when the energy of the day begins to slow down and become more yin. It says we've linked the second half of the day leading up to the evening time or to a yin energy in Chinese medicine, which is all about rest, rejuvenation, and slowing down. It's a great time to schedule lunch. And of course, you know, let's try to eat healthy and we're all struggling with that, right? <laughs> If possible, their tips say to schedule a nap during this time. Yeah, I wish, right? Um, or to take a small meditation break. So it might be something you can do during your um, lunch time or, you know, during that downtime for, you have for just a second. Um, take some deep breaths. I, I That also helps support your organs and to help de-stress you for the um, more yin or more inactive part of your day. The hours of 3 to 5 p.m. represent the bladder. So it's a really good time to do things like um, flushing your, your bladder. It also states here that um, the ancient body clocks um, kind of make us, you know, hit a wall with that uh, wanting to, you know, have a snack or eat something, you know, junk. So this is the time we kind of associate with that. It does say that it's better for scheduling tasks that require less brain power, like grocery shopping, just, you know, that sort of um, admin type work that we don't have to put a lot of thought into because our brains are starting to go into that yin state. Um, it does say, you know, to do the minimal brain power activities. And again, as I mentioned, it's a really good time to um, maybe do like a detox tea for your, your kidneys or your bladder and um, the kidneys next on the clock. So let's move along to some detox. From five to seven is the kidneys. It does say the most important point to highlight during this time is to avoid doing high intensity exercise. So again, I kind of stressed that earlier. It, do, it does say this is especially relevant if you have underlying hormonal imbalances. So it does say thyroid conditions or adrenal fatigue um, are included in that. The late afternoon or evening time is best dedicated to unwinding and relaxing and the balance of well-being in your body is best left to exercising in the morning. So if you enjoy movement as a way to unwind some gentle um, stretching or um, maybe not like a vinyasa yoga flow, but a, um, a really light, uh, deep stretching with deep breathing um, as opposed to, you know, sweating and doing that flow. 
Oh, so along with the detox, um, yeah, doing some detox teas or something and fleshing out your, your kidneys or your organs is a good time, uh, to do that before you go to bed. Um, so yeah, do it during this time. So according to the body clock from 7 to 9 PM represents the hour that can support your pericardium system. So this is actually a membrane or like a sac that surrounds your heart and helps hold your heart into place and make sure it is working properly. So it does say here at a pericardium time is the best time to spend relaxing with your loved ones and from 7 to 9 p.m. You know, it's a time we're kind of un unwinding, um, shut your work down, you know, kind of, um, you know, some things like that that can help you relax. Um, the tips here just say kind of get into some comfy clothes, you know, um, send signal to your brain that the end of the workday is done. Um, it does say lay on your back with your legs up on the wall for a few minutes can be a way to relax your nervous system. And it actually helps really uh, well with lower back pain. So, there's that. 9 to 11 p.m. represents the triple heater. So this isn't necessarily an organ. So the triple heater, triple burner, or the triple um, energizer, sometimes it's called, is actually uh, represents the three um, sectors of your, your dot, your, um, like your torso. And so it can represent like the upper part represents one part of the heater. So that would include like your heart. Um, and the middle part would represent like your stomach, you know, so it's more about the flow of energy than it is about the organ. Cause of course there's not like an organ. Um, so here it says, now it's time to tuck yourself into bed. Your bed's your sanctuary. You know, it's a time where you need to be mindful, switch on that. Do not disturb. Um, it also says that practicing gratitude as part of your nighttime routine can be very helpful. Um, an oil diffuser with some different essential oils can help support your relaxation. So it's really a time to relax. The hours of 11 to 1 a.m. is very important for your gallbladder. And I've heard this before, that it's important for you to sleep to support your gallbladder function during that time. In Chinese medicine, the gallbladder organ is related to decision making. So if you're having difficulty making a decision in life, you may be struggling to sleep during this time. And so that actually goes for any of the times that I've mentioned um, previously. So, you know, if you have time, if you have trouble sleeping during a certain time, or if you find yourself waking up during a certain time, let's, let's focus on what that could mean or what organ can be represented. Cause now's the time that we should be sleeping, you know, 11 PM. Um, it does say here for our gallbladder, we want to um, practice our decision making to support the gallbladder. So in a, again, acupuncture can be very helpful too. So now we want to look at if we're waking up at any time during the night. Um, and this is particularly if you have trouble sleeping or you can't get back to sleep. Um, you know, I think just going, getting up and going to the restroom is fine if you're able to fall right back to sleep. But the liver from 1 to 3 a.m., if you're waking up during this time, pay attention to your liver. The river plays an important role at detoxifying our body. But remember, just like I mentioned earlier, um, on a previous episode um, on the monthly energies that the wood element does represent our liver, which is linked also to aggression or anger. So it does say, you know, if you're waking up during this time, it could indicate that something's out of balance with your liver. Maybe it's overloaded or it's an indication you may have an unhealthy diet or can be consuming excess alcohol. It does say um, your nervous system is stuck in a state of fight or flight. So it could also almost be like that adrenal gland um, pushing, um, you know, that adrenaline through your your liver, your kidneys, everything that can that can mess some things up. So deep sleep during this time is very crucial. So you should be in that state of um, deep sleep. If you're experiencing a lot of stress, you could be waking up during this time. Um, so just some stress reducing activities are very highly recommended as well as reducing your alcohol intake. 3 to 5 a.m. is the lungs. So if you're waking up during this time, it may indicate that you have an imbalance of in your lung energy. Grief and sadness are emotions that are linked to our lungs. Um, it's also the element of metal. So considering what you're, whether you are feeling any emotions, stress, or tension, and it may be blocking your ability to take deep breaths, 
So um, again, that deep breathing is so crucial and important to our our body systems and our body functions. Doing deep breathing um, also helps reduce that fight or flight, that adrenal you know fatigue we, we can experience. So deep breathing it really is what I say. Um, they recommend that having a notebook or a pen on the side of your bed. Um, to remember your dreams, especially if you're waking up during that time and you're, you know, you're waking up with certain dreams. So definitely some deep um, abda- abdominal breathing. So we want to make sure you're breathing in through your nose completely, filling your, your lungs, your stomach, everything up. So your stomach's like pooching out and breathing out completely where all the air is out and, you know, do that a few times. And it really does help reduce the stress levels um, and it helps um, support and take away some of that fight or flight or that adrenal fatigue we may be experiencing. And here's just two little things you can do for your health as far as feng shui goes. One of the ones is you can actually use the yearly flying star number four. I've talked about this a little bit before. You can use that, activate that, place some plants that sit in water, and you can place that in the southeast for the year. It does have that flying star number four. Um, And that does represent health, you know, in um, other systems, it's called the heavenly Yi, and it's something you would look for. It represents medicine. So it's, you know, it could be beneficial to use that area. If you can't um, activate the area of the flower and plants, one of the things you can do, particularly if you have a small space, is you can locate the southeast sector of that room and use what is called the Tai Chi or the small Chi of the area. So you can do this in any area of your home and you can actually store your medicine there. So say um, you pr- usually keep your medicine in your room or, you know, you just maybe you're renting a room and you don't have the use of the whole house. So you can just locate the southeast area of your your space, your room, um, your kitchen, and you can locate your your medicine there. You know, just put just put your medicine there. The second thing you can do, as far as like eight mansions go, and they say it's it's supposed to work um, fairly well for health, is to place your head, your bed position in your Tiani or your heavenly doctor. So this is according to eight mansions feng shui and using your gua number. Um, but you can put your headboard. So the top of your head would go towards like, say your, your heavenly doctor is the West. Your top of your head will go towards the West while your feet go towards the East. So that's kind of how you can use that. If you don't understand how to use uh, Gua numbers and eight mansions. There, I'll include a link. There's a really great link on yourchineseastrology.com, and I'll I'll link that below for you guys. For today's folklore Friday, let's do folklore about the rabbit. It's no doubt that our ancient ancestors were in love with the night sky. There's so many legends and stories that come from the different constellations. So the moon is no different in this. You can quite literally during certain times of the year, see what looks like a rabbit stirring a mortar and pestle on the moon. Um, So this usually occurs during the autumn festivals where they have like the moon cakes, they celebrate the harvest moon. Um, because it is the time of the year where the moon is visible in a way that it looks like a rabbit is in the or on the moon in the shape of the craters in the moon so if you google this you can literally see it so today i wanted to look at some of the cultural differences and some of the different stories about how the rabbit ended up on the moon So we've heard of the legend of Changi and her elixir of life and the rabbit joining her on the moon. But going a little bit further on to Japan, we have the legend of Suki no Usagi. I hopefully I I said that correctly. The moon rabbit is a popular tale in Japan. However, in Japan, he pounds moshi or rice cakes with this pestle rather than the elixir of life. In Japanese, the rabbit in the moon is known as Suki no Usagi, and there's a famous story about him that goes as such. Many years ago, the old man of the moon decided to visit Earth. He disguised himself as a beggar and asked the fox, the monkey, and the rabbit for some food. The monkey climbed a tree and brought him some fruit. The fox went to the stream and caught him a fish. 
but the rabbit had nothing to offer him but some grass. So he asked the beggar to build a fire. After the beggar built a fire, the rabbit jumped into it himself and offered himself as a meal for the beggar to eat. Quickly, the beggar changed back into the old man of the moon and pulled the rabbit from the fire and said, You were most kind, rabbit, but you don't need to harm yourself. And since you were kindest to me, I'm going to take you back to the moon to live with me. The old man carried the rabbit in his arms back to the moon. And he is still here to this very day where the old man left him. Just look at the moon at the night sky and the rabbit is there. This story is said to originate from the Buddhist um, text where the old man in the moon uh, appeared. And sometimes it's a monkey, otter, and jackal that are the rabbit's companions. Also in Japan is the Mid-Autumn Festival. So as in China and Korea, people gather to watch the full moon and children sing songs about the moon and about a rabbit called Usagi or rabbit. And of course, with this tail spanning cultures. I think it's amazing that we've actually found it in Native American legends. So it says here that the it's entitled the Moon Rabbit of Turtle Island. It says here a number of First Nations or Native American people in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico also have stories about the Moon Rabbit as well. The Aztecs believe that the god Quetzalcoatl lived on earth as a man at one time and he started a journey after traveling on foot for some time he became very tired and hungry. Since there was nothing to eat or drink he thought he would die. That is until he came across a rabbit um, eating grass in the field. So she offered herself as food to save his life. Quetzalcoatl was so honored and humbled by the rabbit's offer to sacrifice herself for his well-being that the rabbit was taken to the moon and brought back to earth telling her you're just a rabbit but you will be remembered by everybody your image is in the light of the moon for all people at all times to see another story from the Cree people says that um, they also have a story about the moon rabbit. The mo rabbit really wanted a ride to the moon, but the crane was the only animal that could fly that far. And so the big rabbit held onto the crane's skinny legs. And as a result, the legs were stretched out during the course of the trip. This is why the crane's legs are now elongated. And when they touched down on the moon, the rabbit touched the crane's head with his bloody paw, rewarding him with the red marks on his head that the crane still has to this day. And it does say still to this day, the rabbit is said to ride up to the moon. Looking into the symbolism of the rabbit, um, of course, I think almost across every culture, every um, existence on earth, they probably agree that the rabbit 100% represents fertility. <laughs> so, you know, rabbits are very fertile animals. They reproduce very, very quickly. And so, of course, the rabbit has became a symbol of fertility. But they also represent things like luck, power, success, emotional abundance, and um, also uh, sexual activity. And if you are born under the animal sign of the rabbit, um, one of the things to note is that it's the element of yin wood and it is a peach blossom animal. So it represents the direction of east. The cardinal directions represent the peach blossom animals, which I talked about uh, previously. Um, it also could mean that you're very like visually beautiful and generally have a very sweet personality and sometimes a little bit shy. For a free energy mapping of your floor plan, please check the link in the show notes. To support today's podcast, go to learnfengshui.com, sign up for emails, leave a review, and share with your family and friends.